So the Delphi elicitation process is doing exactly what you described, more or less, as everybody who's involved, right, is first asked by Stephen Software and Stephen himself in combination. He's like a super facilitator, an augmented individual. Um, he asks people uh, different questions about how variables relate to each other given some background story, and, and they propose different dependencies, and then once, once the structure is sorted out, he starts asking about the parameters. Once the parameters are sorted out, then you have a Bayesian net. Okay, so that's one place a Bayesian net can come from. It's uh, probably the most common way of arriving at a Bayesian net is when, you, when you're eliciting from experts, right? So, for example, we did a TB problem and we elicited from people from the WHO and from uh, Victoria, whatever it is, lab. And, uh, and got some busy nuts and stuff like that. So that's a good place to get it. Um, there are problems with that approach, uh, including problems of scale, because frequently the number of parameters to be elicited is huge, and experts are impatient or unavailable or expensive, those kinds of things. So um, there are various kinds of backup things. There's uh, tools that can be used to uh, take some elicited parameters, for example, as constraints on the whole probability distribution and then do maxent or something else to generate artificial parameters for the things you can't elicit. That's one thing you can do. Another thing you can do is start reading literature. You can read about TB and you're, you're not an expert, but you can see what somebody has written down and got published, and maybe that's a sign of the truth. You never know. So you can stick that into a Bayesian net. And finally, this causal discovery. So causal discovery means uh, data mining, basically. So if somebody has gone to the trouble, say, of doing a longitudinal study of uh, tuberculosis in a large population, and they've, every year they've sampled some values about whether a latent case has turned to an acute case, uh, an active case, et cetera, et cetera, then you collect that information. Basically, you get, um, you get a relational database, and if it's big enough, has enough information in it, information is reasonable quality, not too many missing values, et cetera, then you can use the algorithms I'm going to talk about to learn a Bayesian net from it. So that's what this session is mostly about. It, it wanders off into other things as well. Okay, so my goal here is more or less, primary goal is to persuade you that causal discovery is possible. Um, the details of how it works, just a little bit of that. If you want real details, our book covers it in moderate depth. And then there are, um, I mean, th there's a couple of chapters on it. And then if you want to follow up, you can read Kevin Murphy's 500-page uh, book that's all about that stuff and so on. Um, Okay, well, there's a difference between causal Bayesian networks and Bayesian networks generally, and causal discovery yields causal Bayesian networks, either truthfully or untruthfully. That is, it can get the wrong mo model, of course. It can generate, just when you're building your own model, you can generate a wrong model as well. Um, but to the extent that causal discovery works, it's finding causal relationships between variables. Uh, and here's, here's a trivial example. I forgot a pointer. Yeah, but how do I use it? All right. I'll wave. Yep. Okay, so I'll just wave at things. Uh, anyway, so um, so which one of these is causal? One of them is non-causal. They have the same variables. Huh? Statistically, they represent the same data. Do they? No, they don't, actually. If, if you think about deseparation, here white hair is deseparating these two, and over here it isn't. So statistically, they don't represent the same data. Second one's causal. Second one's causal, first one isn't. Presumably, you wouldn't uh, bleach your hair if you wanted a promotion. It'd be relatively pointless, unless you have very strange bosses. Um, OK, so. Uh, Implications. Well, one implication is that if you look at the cause here and look at the effect variable, or what's nominated cause and effect, um, it, it's a non-explanatory relationship. The explanation doesn't work. Another implication is that if you have a system where you can intervene, like with bleach, you can intervene here, you can discover um, no change over here, 
well, you can discover that this isn't the right model. That's one thing you can do. But assuming you have the right model and you can intervene on things like prematurely age someone or something, then you can see the flow on effects. You can, you can look at interventions and reason about them, and that's important for all kinds of reasons. One of them being that frequently um, interventions are possible in being considered. That's one of the reasons why one wants to do causal modeling is to look at, for example, public intervention on screening for TB. Is that going to have an effect or not? If you have a non-causal model, you won't be able to answer the question. And if you have a causal model that's true, correct, then you can. So there's causal explanation, there's understanding, there's also prediction. Causal models can be used for prediction and quite frequently are. Um, and the but here refers to the fact that frequently non-causal models are better than causal models for prediction. So that by and large isn't the, the first and foremost motivation for a causal modeling. Uh, for example, ensemble predictions, um, uh, does anybody know random forests and decision trees? Anyway, they're a kind of data mining representation. So you can generate lots of decision trees. If you generate the best decision tree, um, okay, then you get something that predicts things. And it will predict things optimally if it happens to be the true model. In other words, if whatever's generating the data is actually that decision tree. But that's unlikely. I mean, typically your model space is full of billions or trillions or Carl Sagan numbers of models, and landing on the right one is a very low probability. So you get the wrong decision tree. It's close, otherwise you wouldn't have landed on it, but it's not right, and you use that to predict and you, you make mistakes. Okay, so something that works better is, very often, is getting a probability distribution over your model space and using a uh, posterior probability weighted average prediction. And, and that's like random forests. They do quite well. So the point is, uh, causal modeling is really good for explanation, uh, reasoning hypothetically about intervention, understanding things. And um, it's generally pretty good for prediction, but generally not the best. OK, so by causal discovery, I tend to mean structured learning. Parameter learning is a part of it, but uh, um, the hard problem is structural learning. And, and this idea, you have joint samples on so many variables, you have a big enough sample, and, and you can learn the structure. Do you believe me? Yes. Who doesn't believe me? <laughs> Who's been taught orthodox statistics? You don't believe me. Because I think it's arbitrary. Because if, if, if you just come from a, a block of data, mm -hmm. if that's your, your whole whole universe, yeah. then, then the, the links are arbitrary. Arbitrary? We can just throw any old links in there. But look, what if there are dependencies between, I don't know, region and, and item? Like people in the south, they like pencils, and people in the north, they like pens or something like that. Then there's a dependency between them. You can discover that dependency, and it's not arbitrary. Either you have a link there or you don't. In the data? Well, it's probably just language that I prefer to say the knowledge or understanding is over there rather than there, but anyway. I, I understand your point. If, yeah. if, you, if you put a link between, um, I was going to say, between two things that there, there is a link, between, you, you'll end up with a probability distribution for those two. But, but then if you try to generate fake data uh, uh, from that, um, like use that as, a, as the generator of the data, yeah. then, then you'll, yeah, you'll lose information. It won't match, like, if there was a relationship between Okay, well, I'll try to persuade you that it's not arbitrary, but let's, yeah, let's just move on. Yeah. I, was, I was trying to see if I was going to get any orthodox statistics kind of pushback from my audience here. Has anyone taken statistics? Okay, so don't you disagree vigorously with my claim? <laughs> Sorry? I don't remember much of it. Oh, okay, it's all quite forgettable. Fair enough. Uh, what you might have heard, though, is uh, yeah. somebody like Sir Ronald Fisher announcing to the world uh, that it's impossible, impossible, to learn even the tiniest little grain of anything about causality from correlation. That's what he said. One of the foremost statisticians of the 20th century. Okay, correlation doesn't imply causation. That's a mantra that you can still hear, probably at Manish, if you walk over to, I don't know, some stats class. Um, 
Okay, well, here's an example of, of a stupid causal inference from a dependency, right? A strong dependency has been found between the presence of mobile phone towers and birth defects. Should we infer that mobile phone towers cause birth defects? I'm sure there's some people around the world who believe that because of this dependency. Probably somebody named Malcolm Roberts believes something like this. I'm just guessing. I might be wrong about that. He believes other crazy things. No response? This is perfectly okay with you? No? What's wrong with it? Louder, please. Be assertive. You're not being marked here. It doesn't matter. You can't flunk. Okay, well, we hope not. Um, so here's a possible hypothesis that's behind this kind of statement that phone towers are indeed causing birth defects. Of course, it's possible. There's a dependency. The dependency is real, by the way. It's not a phony dependency. It's not a matter of sampling error or something like that. There's a real dependency. Okay, more phone towers, more birth defects. Okay, but there are alternative explanations. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So part of it is just not being able to reason about things that aren't explicitly stated. And maybe part of it is, is reasoning in absolute numbers rather than relative numbers. Mm, yeah. Well, here's Rick Fisher's own example. He was the, in the employ of the tobacco industry and uh, wrote a, an infamous letter to the British Medical Journal stating that the claimed uh, causal relationship between smoking and cancer could equally well be explained by some hidden variable that we hadn't thought of, like a, a common gene that induces people to smoke and also causes cancer. And he was absolutely right about that. In fact, this would be a kind of classic case of statistically equivalent models, uh, potentially, where, where you, you, you haven't measured this, so you're really just accounting for the dependency between smoking and cancer in terms of a hidden variable or in terms of a direct link. They're statistically equal although one's more complicated than the other, so you might argue that on uh, a priori grounds, the simpler model should be better, Occam's razor and all that. But as far as just matching the observed data, which is just smoking and cancer rates, they do the same job. So until you can knock out this hypothesis, you have to consider this not to be established. That was fair enough. Fisher's point in that regard was fair enough. Here's some other non-causal examples. Firemen cause fires. How do we know this? Because wherever there are large fires, you see large accumulations of fire trucks. Similarly, ice cream causes drowning, <coughs> and CO2 causes human population growth. I'm not so sure. That one might be true, but not in a direct way. And despite all of this, we have in the philosophy of science literature a very strong counter push to the st statisticians. Uh, beginning at least with Hans Reichenbach's uh, 1956 book, um, which, which described in part the common cause principle, which is basically translated in ordinary English, no correlation without causation. The idea behind his principle is that um, if you find a correlation that's, that's uh, consistent, resilient, that when you measure it again and again, it keeps on showing up, there is a causal explanation for it, regardless of Fisher. That doesn't mean there's a naive, that, that the naive, direct, simplistic causal explanation is the right one. It might be some very big nexus that's relating them, but something is doing it, or else it's magic. And science is based on the rejection of magic, and therefore this principle should be adopted by all scientists. It's more or less what he had to say. I'm, I'm a believer in this principle. And so is causal discovery. Causal discovery assumes this. There are cases where it's certainly violated. Um, so there are cases where causal discovery certainly is not correct. For example, um, um, well, a common example is things like the rate of inflation and uh, this, the water level in Venice. Both of those are moving higher and higher over time. If you can talk about time as a causal variable, then you can, you can accept the common cause principle and application to that, but that's a problematic move. Time doesn't seem to want to be a, an ordinary kind of random variable. 
It's an unordinary and a variable. Okay, so um, in fact, these are the relationships which drive causal discovery right here. Uh, you do have copies of, of the notes, right? I suggest you correct this slide because it's not quite right. It says for three variables, there are four types of directed chain. Well, only, only one in three are actually directed chains in the normal language. This is a common cause, and that's a common effect and not a chain at all. So in, in the notes later, I talk about three chains. What I mean there are undirected chains. So if you erase the, the orientation of the arc, but just talk about an undirected link, then these are three chains, undirected. And then there are four ways of directing them. So that's what this refers to. So four, way, four DAGs corresponding to an undirected three chain. And they sort out into these two categories. So there's the category of um, chains and common cause where the, the two end nodes, A and C, are dependent on one another. They're probabilistically dependent on one another. So in other words, if you have a chain and intervene on A, you're going to get an effect on C. But also, if you just measure things jointly, you're going to find a probabilistic dependency between A and C. And similarly, in these, other, these two cases, so there's a marginal dependence between the endpoints on the chain, um, but there's a conditional independence, which is what this uh, describes. It just says that if you observe values of B and then cluster according to the different values of B, and then within those clusters, subsets, look at A and C, the dependency goes away. So like Pearl's example is uh, of a common cause, for example, is where two people uh, both get food poisoning, they go to a restaurant, they have some soup. One of them gets food poisoning. Does that raise the probability without any observation of the other one having food poisoning? The answer is yes, because they might have eaten from some common source, right? But then if you uh, n learn that the, the soup or whatever that they ha shared uh, was in fact contaminated, then all of a sudden knowing that A got food poisoning tells you nothing about C, because you already have all that information in knowing about the soup. So that's D separation, of course. So B D separates A from C, and that happens also in the chains, but it doesn't happen here. And in fact, the dependency signatures, if you like, of these different graphs are exactly opposite. So here you have marginal dependence between the end nodes, and here you have marginal independence, at least as far as this chain is concerned. They might be connected by other stuff, but looking at them in isolation, A and C are independent. But when you observe B, they become dependent. You've all encountered that either yesterday or today, right? Previously? And, and what's this last relationship called? Dependency induced by the common effect? There's a label people use for it. It's not universally used, but no one recalls. Is anyone in the back now? I know you know. Yeah, sure, explaining why, yeah. You did talk about it, right? Yeah, we talked about the screening a lot. Oh, okay. So this is reinforcing, right? Explaining away. So if you have two diseases with a common symptom, knowing about the symptom means that if you learn that this is more likely, that has to become less likely, and vice versa. That's explaining away. But the main point here is not that you have explaining away, but that you have this induced dependency. So you have a marginal independency, induced dependency. You have a marginal de dependency, induced, sorry, uh, dependency, induced independency. Okay. So just the opposite dependency structure. What that means is that when you do joint samples over whatever, anything, over uh, mobile phone towers and birth defects or whatever, uh, and, and some other variable, right, that happens to be related in one of these ways, it's it, the dependency structure in the samples, when you estimate dependencies, correlations, what have you, conditional correlations, you can do that. Uh, it, it either falls into this category or it falls into that category, assuming that there is a three chain in the first place, which, you know, every now and then you get them, and then you, you can sort out which category it falls into. Now, if it falls into this category, if you imagine that your sample data is definitive, it never is, but just pretend. Pretend your sample data is absolutely definitive, like you have an infinite sample size. So noise doesn't matter. And it falls into this category, then you know exactly how to orient your arcs. 
There's no question about it. If it falls into this category, you don't know that. So, so you might have to leave these things undirected. But then later on, you might pick up C in some other three chain and discover that, gee, this has to be oriented this way. And then you know that it's one of these two, or, or so on. So as you recurse and go over more and more variables with your algorithm, you can discover more and more orientations until, quite typically, you get almost everything oriented. It's also typical you don't get everything oriented. But so, so you're somewhere close without being, uh, without the holy grail of a, a fully directed acyclic graph. OK, so that's my pitch that causal discovery is possible. You have these dependencies, structures. You can learn them from the data. You can orient a bunch of arcs. Maybe not everything, but a lot. And then you move on. Then you have a partial network. If you need to turn it into a, a completely fully directed acyclic graph, um, you can, there, there are different things you can do. But at least you can get a long way there. So this is called pattern learning, actually. So a pattern is just a set of directed acyclic graphs that are statistically equivalent, meaning you can parameterize any DAG in the pattern uh, to do exactly the same job in maximizing the likelihood for the data. That was proven in the early days of causal discovery, that there are such patterns and that there's an effective uh, procedure, given no noise in the data, there's an effective procedure for finding it. Okay, so, so these guys are the one pattern and then that's the other. That's just, you can think of them as just the, just the different kinds of dependencies you get in the data. Okay, so three chains are partially learnable. That can be scaled up into large-scale patterns where all but a few arcs are directed. So Alarm is a classic example. Classic, I don't really know why. Um, there are like 32 variables, and, and the, the simple PC algorithm uh, that I'm going to talk about in a minute learns to within, I think, two or three orientations at, at most. And in other words, it's relatively easy to learn. So everybody likes to test against it. Say my algorithm works, and mine too. Um, OK, so the PC algorithm is a, a development of the IC algorithm. The IC algorithm was one that used an oracle. In other words, it pretended that data were perfect. So Burma and Pearl in 1990 uh, just described an algorithm for learning patterns, assuming that you didn't have any problem with data. And then uh, Spurtas, Gleemore, and Shinas turned that into the PC algorithm, which substituted for an oracle uh, statistical significance test. So it just looks at pairs and triples and whatever of variables and does a statsig test. And if it finds there's a dependency there, then it throws a link in. And if it finds there isn't one, it doesn't. Or the other way around, actually. Actually, it starts out with a fully connected network and starts deleting things. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's all the same in the end, except in terms of speed. There's this fast, faster than the straightforward implementation. Uh, anyway, so that PC algorithm is very popular. It's popular um, partly because it's really easy to describe, even though I'm not describing it today, um, and understand, and, um, and it's free. So there you go. So it's Ingenie, Hugen, R, Weka, Tetrad. Tetrad is the uh, Gleemore Group's uh, free program for causal discovery. And I don't know if it's in Agena. Can anyone tell me? It's either in Agena or it isn't. It ought to be. Um, anyway, it's not popular because it works well. It's, it's quick, simple, and works poorly. So. OK, so Agena doesn't have it. That's fine. Uh, they'll probably add it eventually. OK, so all right. So PC and a bunch of other algorithms are um, so-called constraint-based learners. In other words, they're, they're using some statsig test to look at local interactions between variables and, and adding links or orienting links based on that. Uh, there's also metric learners, which we'll get to in the next section. Uh, but first, I guess there's a genie exercise. Shall we do that, or, or shall we not? What, what do you say? Yeah, you, you, you'd be the moderator. Sorry? OK, let's do the exercise then. So 
Um, I don't even remember the exercise. It's somewhere in the notes, but I'll just flip through the Genie uh, uh, screenshots so that you're sort of oriented on. So there's, there's, there's an exercise um, at the back of the book. Yep. The exercise number is. Uh, so exercise 13. All right, so I'm just quickly going to introduce metric causal discovery. I'm not really going to explain it adequately, but just to point out that there's an alternative to the constraint-based uh, learning. Uh, PC is only one of dozens of constraint-based learners, but they all have the same drawback that they're looking at local structure and doing some kind of statistical test to decide what that local structure is. And, and then um, supposing you have a significance level of, of 0.05, then something like one in 20 times is going to give you a, a false positive and you're going to head off in the wrong direction. The metric-based discovery, what the idea there is to have a score not for local structure but for a Bayesian network as a whole. So instead of uh, going through node by node and seeing what's locally connected to this guy, you, you start off with, say, some random model and you start doing mutations on it uh, to do a stochastic search through the model space. Each time you move, look at a candidate model, you score it by some metric, and you move to it if the metric improves, and if you don't, then you may move to it anyway because that's the way these stochastic searches work. Um, but you have a certain probability uh, based on the two metrics, uh, the candidate model and the current model. So you sample the model space, and you build up a, a view of the posterior probability based on the data. That's the idea of all the metric discovery, more or less. Um, it, the arguments are just about how, what the metric should look like. So there are MDL metrics, there are Bayesian metrics, there's MDL metrics, MML metrics. You can use Bayesian information criterion, you can use AIC, the whole mess of things. All, all these statisticians argue with each other about what the best one is. And of course, you run empirical studies and you always find that your method is just this much better than everyone else's and then you publish. That's the way it works. Okay, so we've done that as well at Monash. So with Chris Wallace in the 90s, I developed an MML metric for causal models, uh, which is in the book. Um, okay, but they, they stem from Cooper and Herskovitz. Shortly after Verma and Pearl came up with their stuff, they came up with a, a kind of um, combinatorial way of uh, estimating a, a Bayesian kind of probability for a model. And I don't know what this stuff is on the right, I guess, uh, I guess they're testing whether you can recognize DAGs or not. Wh which one isn't the DAG? No, that's a DAG. Why wouldn't that be a DAG? Direct huh? Directed acyclic graph? Yeah, that's a cyclic graph. Yeah, it's a DAG. I said, which one isn't the DAG? Oh, no, it doesn't matter. I have no idea what those images are doing now. Moving on. Um, okay, so here are some examples. The Microsoft people have BDE, BGE, um, MDL in the mid-90s, and, and CAMEL. CAMEL is also mid-90s, but um, we've developed a little bit further, and it's a little better described in our book than the earlier papers. So. And, and also, it has developed farther. It's, it does more things. So we're using MCMC search. Other people do different kinds of searches, but um, MCMC is pretty common. Um, okay, so one of the things uh, we added in 2006 was uh, support for priors, uh, prior information about the models um, into the CAMEL algorithm. So basically what we did is we uh, took information from experts and encoded it in a way that was accommodated then in the prior probability distribution of the model space. And then the posterior probability is a mixture of that then plus the likelihood of the data, given the data. Um, okay, so this is just talking about some common problems, I guess, of, of discovery in general. So uh, if, you, if you just feed in a flat sample without any priors, then frequently these algorithms will return things like age is causing gender or job success is causing education. And uh, you might know a priori that that's impossible, that certain things are like background conditions, family, income, whatever, things like that tend to be background to, to job success or, or school success or 
health outcomes. So you can just encode directly. Um, a, a lot of the algorithms, including PC, allows you to encode that um, in a hard way. So age can never cause gender. PC allows those tiers, so there's some prior information. Tiers of variables, so these come first, and then this, and then this. Um, with CAMEL, we've gone a little beyond that into encoding lots of other priors as well. And in, in particular, CAMEL allows for soft um, constraints. So instead of forcing education to occur, or uh, sorry, this is, this is actually saying that education causes job success. OK, so you can specify a confidence level with that, uh, a prior probability for the arc existing. Um, and it doesn't have to be one or zero. So, you, so CAMEL can learn that despite the fact that somebody has said that this connection exists, it can learn from the data that it actually doesn't. OK, so we have tiers of variables. Uh, another way of specifying priors with CAMEL is edit distance priors. So you specify a whole network and say, this is the one we think is most likely. And then based on edit distance, similar uh, models will have a high prior, and distant models will have a low prior. And specific relations um, and arc densities, so lots of stuff you can do with CAMEL. It doesn't matter. This is partially advertisement for CAMEL. But uh, on this project, we're not going to be using CAMEL directly. I mean, you're free to use it, but it's not obvious that it will be used. It might be used. OK, so for knowledge engineering, what we suggest is combining data as, as the optimal way of doing it developing calls and models is combining data with experts. If you can get experts who can utter uh, opinions and strength of belief about different kinds of relationships and so forth, then you can use those to uh, give CAMEL a prior. If you can get good data, then you can learn fr from, uh, you're, you're, you have accelerated learning because you're learning based on uh, the understanding that the expert brings to the problem. And in general, we talk about uh, spiral prototyping for, for Bayesian network model building. We're also going to talk about spiral programming for programming, but that's a slightly different topic, which we'll pick up tomorrow, I guess. OK, extensions to CAMEL. We've done learning hybrid Bayesian networks. Uh, what does that mean? I guess we're going to get that to that in the next section on parameter learning, so I'll, I'll ignore it for the moment. Incorporating priors, like I said, learning dynamic Bayesian networks. So that's, you've had dynamic Bayesian networks in here, right? A little bit? OK, so uh, what we did is adapt the MML code specifically to the subset of possible models that are dynamic models. And then that boosted the learning of in dynamic only problems. Uh, I have a PhD student working on latent variable discovery. Uh, we're not doing predictive learning. That would be nice. We have somebody else doing Markov blanket discovery to boost, to parallelize the, the process and hopefully scale it up to large numbers of variables sometime in the future. It's on, versions are on BayesianIntelligence.com, but also on GitHub. Um, OK, caveats. I guess there are plenty of caveats. Learn nets can be complex. You can use priors to reduce the complexity. That's one reasonable use of them. Missing variables can cause problems. Um, when data are available, causal discoveries are usually worth trying. When they're missing, then you should make them available. That's what the last bullet means. When they're missing, that's a problem. Experts can, can boost things. They, you can also build networks entirely with experts and ignore data. But there are lots of problems connected with that. Of, of course, there's the knowledge bottleneck problem of just getting expert time and so forth. But there's also stuff like uh, experts being biased. What do you do about that? If you don't have data, it's hard to de-bias them. <laughs> 